So as our preacher, Rob Sturdy, comes up, um, today it might be a difficult passage. And so uh, what, what, what some pastors do when they encounter a difficult passage is they just avoid it. Well, that's not useful. Other pastors may just be a grown-up and say, well, I'm going to preach on this and, and use my best pastoral skills to guide my congregation through, even if I might offend someone. Which sounds good, but then there's a third option. You can invite a friend to come preach on the hard passage, and then you don't have to deal with whatever he said. And, <laughs> but no, in, in all honesty, it's our great joy once again to have our dear brother and friend, Rob Sturdy, to come and preach for, for us um, as we're preaching through Matthew's gospel, and, um, and, and we uh, started back in August, and we're preaching all the way through the entire gospel before the summer. And so it just so happens that a Rob is going to walk us through this dimension of what it looks like to live in a community, which is God's church, that's shaped by, by a man that poured himself out for the world. And, and so, a brother Rob, it's our joy to have you. As always, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I give you great thanks for my dear brother. Heavenly Father, fill him with your spirit that he might pro- proclaim the good news that you come to bind up the brokenhearted and to heal us, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would fill us with the same spirit that by his word we might be set on fire to share your love with this broken world. Thank you, Lord. We ask all this in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Yesterday, uh, we attended, the, some of us attended the consecration of the new bishop of South Carolina. It's a, it's a two and a half hour long service. And uh, I was actually involved in that at some point as a candidate. So yesterday, I had some comments that made me feel really uh, unknown, I guess. And the comments where I felt poorly known were people who said, one day, it'll be your turn, Rob. <laughs> but where I felt most known yesterday was when I was walking to the communion line past Shane, who was actually supposed to be playing music, but instead Shane pulled me aside and he said, I'm so glad it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a lot of church yesterday. It was two and a half hours worth of church yesterday. And so this morning I woke up and I stretched and I just said, thank you God, I have nothing to do today. Because I thought it was Monday. And so that's on spring break. And Stephanie, she said, what time do you need to get up to be ready? I thought, ready for what? I'm not doing anything. She said, ready to preach at St. Thomas? So I'm here by the grace of my wife, Stephanie. I'm excited to be with you. Let's pray. Jesus, be with us and help us. We ask this in your mighty name. Amen. There's two pivotal exchanges between human beings in the first few chapters of the Bible. The first exchange is an embrace between a newly created man and a newly created woman. This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh is what Adam says the very first time that he sees Eve. Between them, there's a profound similarity. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, but there's also a profound difference, even distance, between the similar persons. The differences between the two of them in their lived experiences and their outlooks and their gifts and their capabilities surely transcends their gender. But this great divide between the two of them is closed by a future embrace. Therefore, continues the text of those early chapters of Genesis, a man shall leave at some point in the future his mother and father, and close that gap of profound difference and hold fast to his wife, they'll become one flesh through the future embrace. The two that were apart and different become a new creation. Pope John Paul II, magisterial work on the human body, argued that it's at the point of embrace when two individuals become a community of persons, that is the point that they come nearest to the image of God. Man becomes an image of God, he wrote, not so much in the moment of his solitude as in the moment of communion. God is, he said, a divine communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's in this first exchange, this exchange of an embrace, that we actually become most like God. It's the first exchange between humans in the early story of the Bible. The second pivotal exchange in these early chapters comes after sin is introduced into the world. 
I'm not sure what you think when you think of what sin is, but the old theologians understood sin as the absence of a good. Not a positive thing that you do, but the absence of good. You can think of an ear deprived of hearing is absent the good of hearing. A blind eye is absent. It's deprived the good of sight. So one of the goods made absent when sin enters the world, one of the things the world is deprived of upon the entrance of sin is community. The embrace between man and woman is dissolved by mutual accusation. The woman you gave me, Adam says in his defense, she gave me the tree, or the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. It's a double accusation against God and the woman that dissolves the good of the community between both of them. The absence of embrace is made total by sin. The editors and translators for our text today from Matthew 19 gave us the title, Jesus is Teaching About Divorce. But that title is not in the original Greek manuscript, and these editorial comments might frame the text more than they need to. I think Jesus' brief exchange between the Pharisees regarding marriage has a lot more to say to us than merely a teaching on divorce. I think these verses speak to a world we find ourselves in, a world full of conflict, a world full of tribalism and disunion. Jesus has something to say about that in this text. God's original plan, not just for married persons, but for all of humanity, is to find mutual embrace. Jesus has something to say about the purposes and plans and goods of community and embrace. He has something to say to those who are always finding reasons to divide and draw boundaries. And that's what I want to talk with you about this morning. Matthew 19, verses 1 to 12, you want to follow along. Jesus had finished these sayings. He went away from Galilee and he entered the region of Judea. Beyond the Jordan, large crowds followed him and he healed them there. An important feature of the work of the Messiah was the work of Apocathestomai, the work of restoration. Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, a contemporary of Jesus, described the work of restoration as essential to the coming of the Messiah. Jesus himself said that the work of restoration would be a hallmark of the age of the Messiah. There are many ways we could think through restoration, but one way the scriptures draw our attention to this morning is through the work of healing. Large crowds followed him, Jesus, says Matthew, and he healed them. Much like today in the ancient world, illness and injury and chronic disease act as powerful forces that separate us from community. In the case of skin disease, that separation was ritual. Lepers were forbidden by religious laws to associate with others. But we also know from experience, people who suffer from physical handicaps are excluded from society in myriad ways. People who suffer from anxiety and depression are excluded from society, often because they simply do not have the will to participate in it. Jesus' ministry of healing, his ministry of apocathistomai, of restoration, reestablishes the sick and the injured and the excluded to society. He restores them to communion and to community. And in doing so, he permits the most important human exchange, not about marriage, in restoring and reestablishing people to society, he permits the embrace between people who are similar but different and brings them nearest to the image of God. That is the work of Jesus' restoration and reestablishing people in the community with one another. One of the recurring opponents to Jesus' ministry of apocathistomy are the Pharisees. Sometimes they oppose Jesus because the timing's wrong. Now is not the time to reestablish someone. Sometimes they oppose Jesus' methods. We really do not like the way, Jesus, you are going about reestablishing people. There's a less disruptive way to reestablish people. Sometimes they oppose even the kind of person Jesus wants to reestablish to community. Other people are deserving of restoration, Jesus. 
But this person is not deserving. We're on board with you when the time and the method and the people are just right. Given the Pharisees' repeated attempts to place obstacles in front of Jesus' ministry of restoration, it's significant that during this eventful period of healing where individuals who are not part of community, where individuals who had no human fellowship are being restored in the hundreds and maybe thousands that the Pharisees raise a question about divorce. The Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any reason? During this frantic activity of unconditionally reestablishing people to communion with one another, the Pharisees wanted to know under what conditions they could do the opposite. More specifically, they wanted to know under what conditions communion could be dissolved at the most fundamental and even original level. The communion between man and woman. French Presbyterian André Trotme, with his wife Magda, was responsible for rescuing some 5,000 Jewish refugees from Nazis in World War II. She observed that there's a tendency to intellectualize ethical issues. And that tendency is in direct proportion to the extent one has become part of the power establishment. This is true of the Pharisees who asked this question, who being men were automatically born into the power structure of society. Rather than starting at the simple and practical observation that one should keep one's vows made to another person, the Pharisees cloud the issue with special circumstances and exemptions. They do so even with an appeal to Moses. Their question reflects the common interpretation of Talmudic law in the first century that maintained a man had absolute right to divorce his wife for anything he found personally offensive. The right to dissolve such union for any reason lay within the hands of the most powerful people in patriarchal society. Lay in the hands of men. Those who would suffer the most from such a casual approach to marriage would be the most vulnerable. The women who would be armed with nothing more than a certificate of divorce and kicked out onto the streets. Jesus responds to this by bringing the Pharisees back to scriptures we've already mentioned. Have you not read, said Jesus, he who created them from the beginning, made them male and female, and said, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. The two will become one. So they're no longer two, but one. What God has joined, let man not separate. It's worth thinking for a moment about how God joins two people together. He doesn't join man and woman together by a miracle. He joins them together by marriage, and the essential feature of marriage is an exchange of promises. An exchange of vows. What are the promises? It's a promise to embrace, to have and to hold. It's a promise to embrace in the present, and it's a promise to embrace the future. It's a promise to embrace the other person through a future of disruptive circumstances. Richer or poorer, I will still have and hold you. Whether sick or healthy, I will still have and hold you. Critically, and most important, whether you are a better person than you are right now, or whether you are a worse person than you are right now, I will still have and hold you. It's a promise to embrace without condition. It's not a matter of feeling. It's a matter of the will. It's a decision to embrace the other person. It's a decision to embrace the other person no matter what. And therefore, union between man and woman in marriage is meant to be inseparable, rooted in a mutual decision. Each is made for the other person that God blesses. But it's not just for married people. One of the things Augustine, who's a great theologian of the early medieval period, had to say about marriage was what the union of husband and wife is fruitful. What he meant by that is 
First there are two, and then there might be three, or four, or five. These new additions aren't excluded from the decision to embrace, but they're the fruit of it. As a fruit, their experience of love in the home ought to resemble the love from which they came. Namely, their experience of love ought to be an experience of love based upon the decision to embrace rather than looking for conditions upon which to exclude. Rather than save that decisive love for marriage that the children are hopefully learning in the home, we expect them to go out into the world and be quick to embrace everyone and slow to exclude any. As a husband and wife practice that decision love on the child, the decision to love without condition, perhaps they learn that same decision love can be extended to neighbors and co-workers and friends. That decision love can even be extended to enemies. And perhaps these neighbors and co-workers and friends and enemies experience embrace without condition. And they too decide to adopt decisive love as a pattern for their own life. And slowly, God's plan was to cover the world with the security of decision love. Rather than the insecurity of separation for any cause. That was God's plan. It's important to admit that Jesus did permit divorce under certain circumstances. Which in the Greek is porneia. Our translators have translated it sexual immorality. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Translation is a pretty tricky bit of business, and I'm afraid, once again, this hasn't quite gotten to the root of things. That Greek word porneia does have strong sexual overtones, but in the Old Testament, the prophets began to use it as a metaphor for spiritual infidelity towards God. And that indicated they saw something at stake that transcends sexual relations. The English reformer Thomas Cramer preferred the Latin term adultero rather than sexual immorality. Why? Well, that Latin term has at its root altero, alteration places the emphasis on something that has changed the union and not for the better. Something that has changed it in a corrupting way. Something that has polluted it. Cramer perceived being faithful to this decision love we've been talking about, being really faithful to it, has a lot more to do than sexual fidelity. What are some things Cramer thought were adulterous? or represented such a corrupting change to marriage as to warrant a divorce. Sexual infidelity was on his list. But so was neglect through absence. Long periods away from the home. Voluntary. Long periods away. Neglect through absence. Cranmer thought that if one of the people in the union gets in the habit of abuse in word or in deed that this was adulterous. And Cranmer thought that violence in the home represented such a betrayal of the decision love that was meant to be in the middle of the union that it was adulterous. Marriage is a training ground to embrace everyone without condition but there's a special embrace between husband and wife that sexual infidelity betrays. Neglect through absence is a refusal to participate in the embrace you promised you would participate in. Abuse in word and deed and violence in the home turns the object of unconditional embrace into the recipient of one's personal anger and anxiety and frustration. Each in their own way is adulterous and that each represents a corrupting change to marriage. Jesus permits but doesn't mandate divorce in such circumstances. And it's really important to say this. The permission is comprehensive. The law that the Pharisees 
put forward was a law that only benefited the powerful because it was only the man who had the right to issue a certificate for any reason. But here Jesus has given permission to the man and the woman. And I want to point this out. This text has been used to keep vulnerable people in situations where they were being abused and manipulated and under threat of violence. And where those texts have been interpreted by people like me on stages like this, it has only benefited the most powerful. Jesus is not interested in providing protection to powerful people to abuse the vulnerable. He is not interested in it. So it's a permission, it's not a mandate. And it's worth saying that if you are in a situation where you are in danger, if you are in a situation where you are experiencing abuse in word and deed, we want to talk to you. Hamilton wants to talk to you. If you are listening to this and wherever St. Thomas's Church puts it, I don't know. We want to talk to you. And I'll tell you straight up, if you're in a dangerous situation or know someone in a dangerous situation, I want you to talk to the police. It's a permission. It's not a mandate. But at the root of it is this. Where someone has refused, has made a decision, I am no longer going to abide by my promise to embrace then we let them live by that decision. You understand? We let them live by that decision. What's happening in this passage is Jesus is having a wide open embrace to hundreds if not thousands of people. And through his ministry of healing, he is reestablishing them into community. He's reestablishing people who will give many reasons for separation. He's reestablishing people that will be troublesome. He's reestablishing people that will sin. He's reestablishing people that will gossip. Reestablishing people that will let the community down. But he has a wide open embrace for all of them. And part of that wide open embrace is the Pharisees themselves. Jesus stands in wide open embrace even for them. And if you want to know the cost of the wide open embrace, the visible cost of God's wide open embrace to these many people he's restoring to communion, the visible cost of his wide open embrace even of the Pharisees is a crucifixion is the visible demonstration of the cost of embrace. It's a visible demonstration of Jesus' decision to love this world through its best days, but more importantly, the crucifixion is God's visible demonstration that he has made a decision to love this world through its very worst day. Times are tough, am I right? Amen. Things are bad. But we've already, we have are, the worst day that human beings will ever have has already occurred 2,000 years ago. Things will not get worse than having God in the flesh at arm's length. Slandering him, lying about him, and killing him. We cannot get lower than that, y'all. <laughs> but it's the crucifixion that proves God has made a decision for human beings. To have a wide open embrace. But that wide open embrace is hard. And it's going to cost. So let me just close with two quick things. One for people who've called on the name of Jesus and one who might be exploring it. 
Here's quick thing number one. When Paul talks about the nature of Christian marriage, one of the things he says, I'm not talking about man and woman. I'm talking about Christ and the church. And so everything we've talked about today has, uh, has wider relevance and appeal than just married people. Okay? What is the wider relevance and what is the wider appeal? In the, in the marriage of Christ in the church, we come to kind of a theoretical knowledge of decision love. I can tell you that I believe Jesus has had a wide open embrace for me because I've read about it. And in some intangible spiritual way, I've experienced the wide open embrace of Jesus for me. But if I want tangible, lived experience, of the wide open embrace of Jesus for me, the place that I find that is in my wife, Stephanie. Because having been married, I'm no good at math, but we've been married a while. I'm a handful, y'all. And there are times when I'm just frankly no good. And I am embraced, for better or for worse, by that woman. Sometimes at cost. And it's being embraced at cost that shows me, tangibly and visibly, what it means to be embraced in a world where people are always looking for reasons to divide. You understand? Always looking for reasons to divide. And in the little home we have, our children, I hope, are in school of learning what it means to be embraced, sometimes at cost. In a world where people are quick to find any reason to separate. What if you don't live in my home? And what if you're not married? is still relevant. Because what I hope a good marriage can provide is a bit of a theater for everyone to look at and see and say, oh, that's what it means to be embraced at great cost. That's what it means to cross differences that divide and embrace. That's what it means. Sometimes you can be a beneficiary of it, because sometimes these, these relationships are so full of this decision love, what Lewis called agape love, he called it unconditional love, but I, I don't like that, I like decision love, that they overflow. And they make decisions for other people as well. We've decided we will embrace you for better or for worse. You belong to us. Sometimes all you need to do is just see it and go, oh, that's how it works. And then you can go out and you can, whether you're married or single, bear the fruit, the fruitfulness of what was intended for Adam and Eve, which is a crossing the distance to embrace rather than finding any reason to separate. And this is something we really need right now, I think. We need, we need to train people what it means to embrace at great cost. I wasn't going to bring this up, but I, I did talk to some folks just before this service started in the public school system. And some folks have said, we can't take it anymore. And I understand that. We can't take it anymore. We can't take it anymore. And some folks have said, well, we don't agree with the way it's being done. But some folks have said, there are kids in these schools that need to be cared for. And whether the school is having it's best moment or it's worst, we have made a decision to be here for these children. That's actually the kind of habit and grace and goodness we need to be teaching people. So I hope you see now, it doesn't have as much to do about marriage as it has to do about the kind of love required for this world to function. If you've been in that situation and you know the cost of that embrace, then I, I do want to promise you there's a, 
There's Easter follows Golgotha. Okay. That's what's coming. For the people who have remained in these situations that are tough. That's just one thing. Here's the other thing. If you're exploring Christianity, one thing I want you to know is that you might have had an experience where people have looked for any reason to separate from you. And I hate to say it, but churches are pretty bad at this. One of the things that my, my young people really struggle with when they graduate from the city and they leave St. Albans, they go out into the world, is they're really surprised to discover churches are places that look for any reason to separate. Maybe your sexual ethics aren't up to snuff. Maybe your moral ethics aren't up to snuff. Maybe you don't believe everything you're supposed to believe. Maybe you don't look the way you're supposed to look. Maybe you've got a few problems that have been following you around like addictions. You just you don't like it. You try to shake it. You can't shake it. And what they've experienced in some places where they've tried to join in worship is that there are people looking for any reason to separate from these young people. And a few weeks ago, one of, one of my alumni, he was really straight up with me. He said, you sold us on the false bill of goods, Rob right? Sir. Because you said, you said that the church was a place that would embrace anybody. And that's not true. But I tell you, if you're in this room, in this church, this one will embrace everybody. And this one is interested in reestablishing everybody. This one is interested in restoring everyone into a community. This one is. And so you can believe it, because I said it, you know, it's theoretical. But if you were to stick around, you might actually get lived experience of it. By people embracing you. Maybe at great cost. I don't know. I don't know. The more you bring in with you, the higher the cost of embrace, right? But that's okay, because I know there are people here willing to pay and they'll prove Jesus to you. Might take a little courage on your part to put yourself out there. But you should. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that um, I pray that we would never second guess the work of restoration that Jesus is doing. I pray the work of restoration wouldn't make us so instinctively nervous we would want to ask questions about when it's lawful to draw boundaries and separate. We pray, Jesus, that in marriage and friendship and family and church you would train all of us what it means to embrace. And the call of it. We ask this in your mighty name. Amen.